I think that where we need to go is really tailored to each company. And there are different industries, different job categories in which I think remote or hybrid work better. You can structure a workforce where you're giving people the flexibility in a structured way to work at home. You could actually enhance productivity if it's done right. The question I have, and I don't have an answer to this, is how do you create a culture that sustains the business if you're more remote than in office? We raised our first tranche of money in the pandemic all by Zoom. There's ways to do it. Now, the key to that was that we had a network in place. We had relationships already established. There was a trust factor that we didn't have to build. We had already earned it through a thousand different interactions, right? Which is going back to this issue for young people newly starting their career in whatever, you know, whatever pursuit they have. They don't have that network. They have to build it and you can't build it over the internet. Welcome back to Talent Hunters powered by MRI Network where each week we talk with the world's top talent strategists and executive recruiters. If you want to build talented teams that drive your company to big goals and big growth, then this podcast is for you. And now let's join the conversation with today's episode of Talent Hunters. Welcome back to Talent Hunters. We have a very special guest on the show today as former Governor Jeb Bush joins host Vince Holt and HireQuest CEO Rick Hermans to discuss remote work and the ongoing trilemma CEOs are facing. Governor Bush has a very unique perspective, having spent most of his working career in offices, but now running a nonprofit with a fully remote team. So part one will focus on this topic and part two of the conversation with Governor Bush and Rick will focus on Governor Bush's foundation and their work in education across the globe. So let's jump into the first part of this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Vince Holt, the host of Talent Hunters. And today, once again, we have the honor of having Rick Hermans, the CEO of HireQuest Incorporated, located in Goose Creek, South Carolina, with us. We have another very special guest with us. And Rick, would you mind introducing our guest? Yeah, thank you, uh, Vince. Today, we do have a very special guest, uh, former Governor Bush. In the state of Florida, I've known Governor Bush for 30, more than 30 years now, uh, going back to uh, his first run for for governor. And of course, he was one of the very best governors of the state of Florida. And since that time, though, I've continued to maintain a relationship with him and know him for his passion for education and for learning. He's one of the smartest He's one of the smartest fellows you'll ever meet and a very thoughtful person. And so I uh, really appreciate him being on Talent Hunters today and looking forward to his insights as to uh, the trilemma that we face right now between uh, remote working, in-office mandates, and hybrid situations. So again, without further ado, uh, welcome to you, Governor Bush. Thank you, Rick. Um, I guess since we've known each other for 30 years, that just uh, implies that we're, o- we're older than dirt. <laughs> you know, so, but it's good to be with you. And Vince, it's a pleasure meeting you. And I uh, look forward to the conversation for sure. And it's good to be with somebody who's even older than us with Vince. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All three of us are, are interested in, in up and taking nourishment. That's the fourth option between working in the office hybrid and doing it at home. We just want to get up and do something. <laughs> you have a for-profit business investment firm. Um, this is probably more to what the rest of us world deals with is day-to-day business to make a buck. And what I'd like to do is appeal to you and Rick going back to the early days of both of your careers. Um, you learn business by being in the office. What do you feel the Zoomers are going to miss out on by working remotely or hybrid? How do you feel we can draw this together to get to where we understand what works and what doesn't work? Sure. I, I, I would say, and we'll, we should probably also talk about the benefits of remote or hybrid work as well, because there's clearly there's some that we've just experienced. I mean, like I personally have never worked remotely in my entire life until uh, the pandemic. And um, we can talk about that. But as a kid, I mean, I I got out of school when I was 21. 
uh, married, um, got out of school in two years. I got out quick. I was in love. You know, I had no clue what I was, how was, how things were going to work. If I wasn't in the office, I wouldn't have learned. I wouldn't have been with people who had great experience and I wouldn't have learned from them. Uh, it would have been, I would have fallen flat on my face. Um, and the interpersonal skills you have to have, uh, thankfully, you know, I was when I was brought into the world, I woke up my little eyes, opened up my little eyes, and there was Barbara Bush. And she taught me all of the kind of things that a lot of kids these days don't get, like be respectful of your elders, look people in the eye, firm handshake, yes, sir, no, ma'am. Uh, always try to do what's right. All the things that, you know, hopefully become habits I had as my advantage, but I didn't have any business interaction. And so, you know, I can't imagine a freshly minted college student or someone who has um, gained a nationally recognized certificate that shows that they're an information technologist and they can, you know, get a job for a whole bunch of companies or someone who's got some skills in cybersecurity may not need a college degree, but they have no, I mean, they don't show up to work. What are they going to do? It, it just it would be impossible for me to see how um, people can succeed like that. Now, you know, as I said, there's some advantages, but as a young person, I, you know, you lose out on all the mentorship possibilities. And I think that is something that businesses really need to focus on. Rick, you've put out a white paper on this topic directly. What are what what are your feelings and where do you think we need to go? Well, I will say I think that where we need to go is really tailored to each company. And there are different industries, different job categories in which I think remote or hybrid works works better. And even frankly, you know, really age groups, because I think that the 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 person who's again a freshly minted you know, a freshly minted business student coming out. I just don't know how you properly learn your job. I, I think back to, you know, getting out of grad school and becoming a banker. I, I can't imagine how I could have become an effective banker without sitting next to, you know, 10 other bankers who had been there, already been doing it for 20, 30 years. And beyond the fact that, and I think that it's a, it's a, culture issue as well. If you don't, you know, if all you do is you talk to people on a, you know, on a Zoom call every other day or something, it feels really hard to create that, that shared purpose. That being said, there are absolutely huge advantages to both the employer and the employee for working, you know, for working remote. And so it's balancing it. My biggest, my biggest fear frankly, is though, is that companies and organizations are making emotional, you know, more or less emotional decisions where it's sort of like, ah, we've got sort of a mini revolution going on. Our accounting department really wants to work from home. And I really don't want to have to, you know, I don't really want to have to replace four people. So that's fine. We'll let them work from, you know, we'll let them work from home instead of really sitting there saying, what, well, you know, Maybe this will, you know, make the crisis, you know, it'll kick the can six months or two years down the road. But ultimately, are they really, you know, are they really thinking it through? And so part of what we're trying to do at HireQuest and MRI is to really help our clients and consult with them in such a way where it's like, look, don't just make a quick you know, don't make a quick decision based on your current staffing needs, but look ahead and sit there and say, what is this going to do? For, you know, what is this going to do to my business in the long run? What is this going to do to my department? And, and yes, maybe it means, you know, and, and it could be either way, right? There are people, there are dinosaurs like me that I, I tend to lean in office. I, I, I tend to be skeptical a lot of times of, you know, of, remote. And it doesn't mean that I don't know, you know, that I don't understand some of the advantages. I'm, I just, and it just tends to be, um, how I lead, but I have to, you know, basically teach myself as well to make sure that I don't make decisions based on my own values, 
versus what's best for the for the company. And so what we're trying to do is bring as much, you know, basically, first of all, encouraging our clients to, again, really take a close, close look of, you know, before they make those types of decisions, not to be bull rushed into a, you know, again, into a fast decision rather than a good decision. And, um, you know, to, to bring them statistics so they can really look at it, you know what I mean? Because some of the, look, some of the benefits of remote work are obvious, right? I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to provide office space. Well, that's great, right? You just, right off the top, you sit there and say, and for a lot of companies, especially if you're, you know, shoot, what is office, but, you know, class B office space in Miami right now, governor, what is it? Class, class A is space is like $150 a foot. Class Holy B no. space, you know, it's crazy and it's nuts. And yeah, you know, the expense. And, and I would add that commute expense. I mean, when I moved to Miami in 1981, I commuted 17 miles to our little office in the financial district, Brickell. Um, and it took it took anywhere from 50 to minutes to an hour and 10 minutes. Back then, there was no other, you know, there was no podcast. There was no like. We didn't. We hadn't gotten to the point where the cell phones with the big battery pack. We hadn't gotten to that yet. <laughs> and um, that's that's that time. If you add, you know, if you just add that up, it's hours and hours of lost productivity and a strain, you know, on family life. Um, it seems like that. You know, if you can structure a uh, a workforce where you're giving people the flexibility in a structured way to work at home, um, you could actually enhance productivity if it's done right, if it's done in, in a way that you're not just, you know, the wild west where you just let, let the big dog eat, as we say in West Texas, you know, you're, you're gonna be in, you know, you can, you can do this where there's, um, I think, more fulfillment for the employees and as much productivity. The question I have, and I don't have an answer to this, is how do you create a culture that sustains the business if you're, you know, really, you know, more remote than in, in office. I don't, and, and for young people who don't have networks that they've built and established, how do they progress? I, 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 to me, that's why the working in, in the office uh, is important. I'll add, you know, like I mentioned, the Excel and Ed has 60 employees. We don't, um, we have a small office in Tallahassee, but very few people go into it. And, uh, the way that uh, Patricia Lebeck, who runs the foundation, deals with this is, A, we have our annual summit where everybody gathers. The whole team is there. They get there early. And that's one place where, you know, there's a camaraderie and a, um, a sense of unity. And then they have a offsite every year in a particular place. And they typically, it's not like, you know, they went to the, they went to the, um, they went to Selma, Alabama. Uh, for um, a two or three day time where they, you know, where they talked, they, they learned about um, Martin Luther King's journey. And they, you know, then they had a lot of interactions um, where they built teamwork. So, um, you know, there's ways to deal, mitigate with um, the challenge of offsite work to, to help create some cohesion. Um, but it isn't easy. For Do you sure. have any tools that you use to measure productivity or is it more you're just eyeballing it and you kind of know what you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, you have to be aware. We don't we don't do the uh, I, I've read that there are some businesses and you wrote about it in your report, Rick, where, you know, they're actually monitoring computer use. I mean, that's, uh, to me, if you try to build culture, I'm not sure, you know, like having Big Brother overseeing what what's not being done or catching people using tools to play like they're working um you know over time you know if people are productive you just know see i think you know. i think you you both are hitting on something there there's three categories that i see one is and governor you you mentioned this to begin with it's the training the the real weakness i see out there is training remote people to what you need to get done and teaching them how to get that done with them not having the accountability. The second part is accountability. 
if we're paying people to get a job done, I mean, this country has thrived on salespeople who have worked remotely for decades. So the working remote isn't brand new, but parts of what we do every day is brand new. And that comes down to accountability and results. So we've worked with salespeople that we've managed for years to their results or what we need in, in results. What we need to understand is how do we train the people for the normally the in-office stuff? How do we train them to be able to work remote? Because our education system doesn't teach people to work remote. They don't teach anybody to do other than if I'm going to be an attorney, how to be a good attorney. If I'm going to be a doctor, how to be a good doctor. How do you teach people to work remote? And then we have to have that accountability factor. What do you guys think of that idea? Totally agree with it, for sure. And then you've got, you know, you do have technology to enhance uh, people's productivity. Um, I mean, we, our, our business, we, we all went, the whole world went remote. We were thankfully in a state that um, opened up like in three months. I mean, I started going to work. My office is at, a, at the Biltmore Hotel. And it was locked up. I literally uh, had a padlock on the door to get to my office, and they gave me a key. I mean, we were we, we were working uh, in our little office um, uh, within two and a half months, and Florida opened up within three or four months, five months at most. So uh, the accountability part of this uh, is great, and and there are tools to enhance your productivity. We raised a a big, you know, our, our first tranche of money in in the pandemic all by Zoom. Um, there's ways to do it. Now, the, the key to that was that we had a network in place. We had relationships already established. There was a trust factor that we didn't have to build. We had already earned it through a thousand different interactions, right? Uh, which is going back to this issue for young people newly starting their career and whatever, you know, whatever pursuit they have, they don't have that network. Uh, they have to build it and you can't build it over the internet. You just can't. It's not, it's not going to be successful. If it is, it's going to be like a reality TV thing. You know, you're an influencer. It's also superficial. The meaningful relationships have to be human ones, one-on-one. -on -one. And um, that's why I think, you know, if the three options that you've suggested, Rick, in your study, the, the one that I think, I mean, obviously, Every business has a unique challenge and unique opportunities, but the hybrid uh, offers, I think, the greatest convergence of trying to build culture, trying to enhance productivity, trying to create a happy workforce. It seems to me that's the the path forward for for more companies than we would ever imagine prior to the pandemic. So, Rick, you've dealt with a lot of CEOs and and having the opportunity to engage regarding your paper. What is the feedback you're getting from the CEOs out there in really the problem areas and how to overcome those problem areas? And that's, that's where, like I said before, my biggest, one of my biggest fears, frankly, is, is that a lot of them are, they're looking at it more circumstantial. This is, you know, circumstantially, they're just looking at you know, sort of how it is right now. And if they have, you know, <laughs> without really looking at the data, you know, and again, and, and, and again, my, my concern even, and, and, and listen, I've agreed with everything that's said, which, so now I sound like, you know, I, I, I sound like a, well, I sound like a certain politician. I sound like a certain politician. I agree with everybody without agreeing to anything. And <laughs> like, for example, the, the reality is, let, let, let's use as an example, it is a known fact, for example, that um, anxiety and depression is highest really among Zoomers. And yet they're the ones who would state, and it's sort of cited in the study, are the ones who are most desirous of working remotely. And so it's, you know, it becomes one of those things is, are you desiring the very thing that's creating, you know, social 
you know, basically, you know, really bad psychological effects, right? Like, you know, if you're, you already tend to be more isolated and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, it drives me crazy all the time. Even, you know, my older kids are, you know, my two older kids are a little bit older and it's like, and I remember when texting first started and it's kind of like, they start sending me texts. It's like, listen, if it's past three texts, pick the dang phone up. I want to talk, you know, I want to talk to you. And, you know, and when you get to that, you know, again, you have a, again, a 24 year old who really doesn't know that many people and then ends up, you know, and is, has been influenced by the influencers and sort of a, and a bit of an unreal world, you know, then you start getting into, well, look, I just want a person that goes back to what the governor said before. It's like, I want a person who just looked me in the eyes and sit there and, you know, I may disagree with them or agree with them, you know, but you can have those sort of conversations and you learn from them. And it goes back to, you know, a, a, again, the long term impacts of that, as an example, are are bigger as well. And it's sort of like, what are you, you know, what are you doing? And And I guess I would say, perhaps more importantly, and this is more from a, I guess, even, and I'd be interested to get your take, Governor, on this, is like, to me, one of the things, the long, one in the long run that what I have seen in my discussions with CEOs, and, and just the research bears it out, is, is that large companies, but even now it's reached into much smaller companies, are offshoring a lot of tasks. It's hard, you know, it's harder to find employees and to manage them and maintain them and then the costs thereof. And so all of a sudden, call sent, you know, and it started a long time ago with call centers going to, whether it was to India or the Philippines, et cetera. But it's becoming more and more common that that happens. And one of the other sort of fears that I have, both from country that I love and for again, younger people who are going to have to live in this world that we're creating is that, well, okay, if you're going to work remote and you're doing a relatively, I'll say, rote job, not, you know, or something that's fairly systematic, why don't I just move it to Mexico City and pay half the price? And or why not start, automate it? Or automate it. And then we just start hollowing it out. But the thing that we can't replace is people. I mean, really, I mean, or relationships, that interaction, we all want it. We all heard of that study back, I think it was in the 40s, where they took like babies and, you know, they had like a machine feed the bottle and the babies died, you know, because, you know, we're, we are, you know, we were, we were designed by, in my opinion, by God, that, you know, that, that we need human touch, we need human interaction. And so I think that that's one of those things, regardless of even if you're fully remote, it's such an important thing to keep then. Yeah. And it's one of the hardest, you know, it's one of the hardest aspects, but it has long-term economic. My, my only point is to go back to is it has long, in my view, it has long-term economic, uh, you know, implications insofar as more and more companies, I fear, will start offshoring more and more of that, you know, more and more of that's work. So you, you brought up a, a point that uh, takes me back to the work of Excel and Ed, and I want to. Um, in the long-term challenge we face that I think resolves this question of where people are going to work is eliminating the skills gap, so that people are qualified for work to start with. You know that there's there's three or four million jobs that are unfilled because people don't have the skills to to take them on. They may have the desire to do it. The, the, you know, the work ethic to do it, but they're not qualified for those jobs. And our systems around particularly young people are, are failing them. And secondly, the generation of, of young people that are emerging in the workforce uh, were kids in 2012 when the explosion of social media and the iPhone particularly, but other phones as well, the Android phones as well, came into our world. Uh, and prior to that, Parents hovering over their children um, basically eliminated self-play as a as a part of growing up. So you have these kids that are fragile. They're immersed in social media at a way too early age. Girls are bullied on the Internet brutally. And, and that generation of kids 
no one has experienced what they've had to go through. Boys are watching pornography and they're all obsessed about social media. So one of the solutions has to be allow, requiring kids, I think, at the age, not being allowed, not, not allowing them to have a social media account until they're 16. Because they're, they're preyed on, by the way, by the, the big, uh, these big media platforms um, that get them hooked on, on uh, the information that comes. And the algorithms basically reward more and more of the behavior we don't, we don't want to see. Secondly, parents need to let go and let their kids play and dis- resolve disputes and and become more uh, able to be able to make decisions for themselves and not be coddled uh, to the point where they're just they go to college and they're weak and they they need safe spaces and they fall prey to the you know the ideologies of college and they they lose their motivation and then thirdly, I'd say no school should have a uh, should should allow cell phone use during school hours. If we did those three things, uh, we would quickly create a workforce, you know, in a pretty short period of time, five or six years, that would be more resilient. And that resiliency, I think, would allow them to uh, be more capable of dealing with remote versus working in the, you know, hybrid format or in the office. But right now, if you're, you're, you know, if the youngins are the ones saying we have to work remote, you're gonna have a bad outcome. Because they've had 10 years of being immersed in uh, uh, in social media through the internet and through these computers that are the most high powered things that, you know we can hold in our hand. That twenty five third when we started working, Rick, you know, right up the computer would have taken an entire room. Now people are walking around with this in their hand and they have access to more information they know what to do with, and it, it's not creating the kind of resiliency you need to be productive. Now, I can guarantee you that's not a problem in, in India, not a problem in, you know, it's maybe a problem in parts of, you know, the UK and other places, but we're weakening ourselves from within by thinking we're, you know, giving these young people this, this, the tools to be successful when we're not doing it. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. And our foundation's working on this. And gosh, I mean, like I, I just saw Gavin Newsom passed a signed a law bill into law that said that in the next two years, all California schools um, have to ban the use of cell phones. Um, I mean, it should have been done immediately, but in California, two years is still a victory as far as I'm concerned. New York's looking to do the same thing. Florida's already done it. Um, we're working at, across, Glenn Youngkin's doing it across the country now. Uh, Democrats and Republican leaders are saying, yeah, we should do this. Now that's encouraging. That's it's a step. I think we've touched the tip of the iceberg on this subject. Uh, this this is a never-ending question that's going through as far as where we can bolster our education. And thank you for your passionate and your foundation, Governor. It's it's really a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I, I got one final question, Governor, and we'll keep this brief. Um, due to your history and your family history. Any interesting predictions on the outcome of the election? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to uh, I want to please th- please thank your uh, your family members of the three teachers and tell them that um, stay at it. It's important work. Um, we really appreciate what they do. Uh, no, I don't have a you know I I'm um, I'm a strong believer that the polls have been wrong almost every election six sixteen in some cases really wrong. And so the conventional wisdom three weeks ago, four weeks ago, was the Kamala Harris. Two months ago, it was Trump's going to kill Biden. A month ago, Harris was going to kill or not kill Trump, but when the consensus emerged on that. Now the consensus has emerged that uh, President Trump is the likely winner. And um, I have enough humility to know that, like, that it's, it's down to a really sliver of the electorate. And these are principally people, the people that have, most people have made up their minds. The ones that haven't are low intensity voters. And that group is a tiny universe in a tiny part of the country, seven states. And those poor people are going to be bombarded like nobody's business in the last two weeks to drive them to the polls. And the election will be decided by them. And I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, It's a big consequential election for sure. Um, in a deeply divided country, you would love to see 
some elected official trying to be creative enough to forge consensus and to build on the things we have in common. But that hadn't happened in a while. So we'll see. We see how it plays out. I, I don't have a prediction. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much for taking the time. Rick, thank you for allowing me to host this platform. And uh, I look forward to engaging with both of you in the future. Thank right. you, guys. Thank you, Vince. Thanks for listening to part one of this fascinating conversation. And make sure you're subscribed to the podcast to get part two, where Governor Bush and Rick dive into the nonprofit world and Governor Bush's work in education. And we'll see you there.